Good morning church. Isaiah chapter 12 verse 2 says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For here the Lord is my strength and song. He also has become my salvation. So let's just praise the Lord, worship the Lord, sing to the Lord from our homes and declare His praises. Offering to our God. 
We worship you, Jesus. The angels surround your throne, O Lord. The elders and the saints lift up your praises, Jesus. Lay their crowns down, O God. Worship you, Jesus. Thank you, God. We worship you today, O Lord. You are our awesome God, our everlasting Father. O oh, our Prince of Peace, O oh, our Wonderful Counselor, You are our Mighty God. Thank You, Jesus. Continue to bless this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning, Church. It's another wonderful Sunday morning where we can gather and praise and worship the Lord from our homes and prepare ourselves to receive the Word of God with the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, I hope you all are doing well. Today, we've got two amazing portions that we will hear shortly. And right after church service, we have a rap session on the Zoom platform where we continue to meditate on what we have just heard. So I want to encourage every one of us to join in for the wrap by clicking the link in the comment section right after church service. Well, I now request Joseph to take us forward with the offering. Good morning, church. Good to be with you all. I'm going to share the offering message. And the passage that I've chosen is Proverbs 11, verse 24, 25. And the verse 24 says, he who scatters yet increases more and there is one who withholds more than just but it leads to poverty in the natural we will see that the one who withholds more will actually save and will therefore become rich and the one who scatters will actually become poor but in the God's economy, it is a contrary principle and it is explained in verse 25, which says the generous soul will be made rich and he who waters will also be watered himself. And this is what we understand when we give up our offering in the church, we see there is an mystical operation of God's grace in what we are doing as a body. And there is yet another clarification which is given in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 and 8. Six, verse 6 amplifies this concept of verse 24 in Proverbs 11 which says, He who sows free, uh, sparingly reaps sparingly and he who sows bountifully will reap bountifully. But in verse 8, we are actually explained how God blesses us. Verse 8 says, God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. And here we are in Andheri Church. This is the Mother Church and we have many mission fields and many other churches and much of God works gets supported by this church. And Paul, when he was writing to the Corinthians in 2nd Corinthians chapter 12, he tells the Corinthian church, for children ought not to lay up for the parents, but parents for the children. And then he goes on to say, and I will very gladly spend and be spent for your soul. And this verse could so very easily make us understand Pastor Carl's life. He was willing to spend and be spent for souls. Here we are about to give our offering and I would like to encourage you to look at this offering not as our own act 
of gratitude but an act which is partnering with god's operation simultaneously and we see that his grace will not only prompt us to sow abundantly but to also reap abundantly let us pray god we thank you for this time bless the offering thank you that you showed us pastor carl's life how he was willing to spend and be spent here we are we give our offering to you lord out of what you have given us for all the blessings that you have given us we give a small portion to you and thank you for your grace operation operating in our life in your precious name we pray amen
brought my heart these days I remember you are faithful God forever yes hi uh, good morning greater grace it's great to be with you on a Sunday morning and uh, once again, we want to thank Craig and the uh, worship team that always put together a wonderful time of worship for us. Today, we're in, for, in store for a real treat. Uh, we have a message preached by Pastor Carl in 2010 called Brokenness and the Blessing. And uh, so I will we'll do a short introduction prior to the main message. And so let's just bow and pray. Father, we do ask, Lord, that you would just really anoint this message. Anoint the messenger and anoint the ears that hear, that it would be a real blessing to each one. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, uh, the um, brokenness is not something that the world values. The world may uh, uh, define it as being bruised, wounded, and shattered but it finds no value in it. Uh, sometimes the world may say that it is dysfunctional, it doesn't function, it doesn't serve our purposes. Um, many times individuals will try to get help from the world or helping themselves, but nonetheless falling short of that. You know, Proverbs chapter 18, verse 14 says, a wounded spirit who can bear it with really the connotation, the answer would be, well, no one is meant to bear it. No, no one is meant to live on this earth without a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Situations in life just become too heavy, too tough. Uh, they beat up individuals, and the life becomes broken and dysfunctional. And the devil loves to pounce on that. He loves to use this to uh, destroy people's lives but brokenness is something that Christ okay really values very very highly he esteems it in fact if we if we look at uh, Christ on the cross he was crucified he was broken for us and uh, Christ okay as the when he walked on this earth uh, as okay with his uh, as as walked on this earth among us he was not removed from our infirmities uh, Christ does not distance himself from us and uh, and he was broken when he looked out over the city of Jerusalem and he saw them as sheep without a shepherd he had compassion uh, he was broken for them and he wept when he saw Lazarus um, Lazarus' family, Mary and Martha, gathered around uh, weeping for um, uh, the, the loss of their brother. It said that Jesus Christ wept. We actually saw the brokenness of, of Christ while he walked on this earth. And he desires that brokenness in our life. Well, what produces that brokenness? Well, Life situations uh, sometimes can produce a brokenness in, in our lives. Uh, but I really believe that the ultimately the, the, the one who produces that brokenness in our life is the Holy Spirit. He may use life situations. He may use sin in our life. He may use disappointments in our life. But ultimately, the Holy Spirit is the one that's involved with that brokenness. And at the moment of our salvation, at the moment uh, that, that, we, that we looked up to, looked up to God and we cried out for help and we asked Christ to come in our life, that was a time of our brokenness. Our, our, our brokenness that allowed Christ to come in our life. Well, that was positional. That was one time that provided the salvation that is eternal. But Christ desires that same brokenness uh, in our lives on a daily basis so we would receive the fullness of Christ. 
You know, Christ says in John chapter 10, verse 10, he says, I came that you might have light and that you might have it more abundantly. The above and beyond life, the abounding life, the life, okay, that is like supernatural. And uh, in daily, he desire us, desires us to, um, to experience that, but it requires brokenness. If I have a hardness in my heart, or if I have a walled up heart, then I will not experience the fullness. I will not experience, okay, the rivers of living water flowing through my life. You know, you can take rivers and you can dam off those rivers by, by being a blockade and those rivers stop flowing. They will not flow. But God does not desire for us to wall off our hearts. He allows our, he wants our hearts to be broken. And you know, a scripture that meant so much to me um, about 10 years ago, it's Isaiah 57, 15, and it still means very, very special to me. It says, for thus says the high and the lofty one that inhabits eternity. Can you imagine, okay, you might know where your neighbor lives, you might know where your relatives live, but in this scripture it says, where God lives, he inhabits eternity. We can't even define that with any of our, the wildest imaginations, with any, okay, uh, definition we define that. But he says that, that he is high and lofty and he inhabits in turn, that his name is holy. And I dwell in a high <clears throat> and holy place. That's where he dwells and says, and with him, God dwells, okay, in that high and holy place, but he dwells, okay, with us. That is amazing. How does that happen? How does that experience happen? How does our, like, the experience reality of the fullness of Christ every day? It's through brokenness, through brokenness. It's not through pride. Pride walls up our life, but brokenness allows, brokenness produced by the Holy Spirit allows those rivers of living water to flow through our lives that we might know in Ephesians 3.19 the fullness of God that Christ would that, 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 the, that the love of Christ that passes knowledge and that we would be filled with the fullness of God the pleroma if you will the filling of the Holy Spirit that comes through brokenness and you know what I have to I have to uh, I want to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, to the adjustments that the Holy Spirit wants me to make, the adjustments that, that could potentially, um, you know, I can potentially left to myself, I could become kind of walled off. I can be less broken. I can be proud. And, uh, but God desires us to be sensitive to make those adjustments that God would be very, very large and that I would be very, very small. And God says this, he says that I dwell with and dwell with him also that is a contrite and humble spirit. That's the man that God dwells with. In a later chapter in Isaiah, God dwells with a man that trembles at his word and uh, to reveal, the, to revive the spirit of the humble. When, when the fullness of God comes into our life, that it makes us alive. It revives us and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Those that have been broken, like Christ, okay, was broken on the cross, but after the cross was resurrected life. When we are broken, Christ comes into our life the fullness of Christ is within our life. We are revived, okay? We have become alive. That same life that Christ, that, that same, the Holy Spirit that rose Christ from the dead dwells within us. And that Holy Spirit gives us that resurrected life. And, okay, in Mark chapter 14, 
like the woman that came in with the alabaster box uh, when the, Jesus was in the and the home dining with Simon the leper in Mark 14 said that that she had a very very precious ointment and uh, and uh, w uh, with spike nard and uh, in a in an alabaster box there's no way you can get that ointment out of the box without breaking it the way the alabaster meant that it had to be broken and she broke that box you know um, my life your life has to be broken pastor carl's life was a broken life it was a broken life and as a result the fragrance of christ was always revealed through his life the presence of god was always revealed when you were with him and uh it was such a very very he 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 allowed christ to the, and the Holy Spirit to break his life so that the life of Christ could be revealed to those around. God desires that. God highly esteems brokenness. And just really, really be, on, be, be looking for the Holy Spirit to produce that broken. This would be a good prayer that uh, for myself and for you we could pray Lord just just do not give me knowledge just do not give me information in my mind but God I this is the prayer God give me give me brokenness that I would receive all the fullness of Christ and that the fullness of Christ would be revealed to a lost and dying world. So, uh, God bless you, and uh, stay tuned for that wonderful message by Pastor Carl. Amen. Wow. Praise God. Are you excited about tonight's message? Um, it's very fresh and very, very edifying. And uh, I think one of the, probably one of the most important messages a Christian can ever hear Okay, on the subject of a servant being broken, because uh, that's what God really wants in our lives. So let's let's turn to Second Corinthians chapter four. <clears throat> let's just stand for a moment. I've given you a little bit of a handout so you can think about some. It's not really the main points of the message, but it is some of the things that I want you to think about. Uh, Sunday morning we began a series on what it means to be a servant of God. And so we just read from 2 Corinthians 4. And these were just some of my meditations as we think about this subject. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Again, we'll read it. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus as Lord and ourselves as servants for Jesus' sake. That's what a servant does. We don't minister for ourselves, but we minister for Jesus. For God who said, light shall shine out of darkness, is the one who is shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels so that the surpassing greatness, the word greatness, megaloliotes, means majesty, so that the surpassing majesty of the power will be of God and not of ourselves. So we are afflicted on every side, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but we are not despairing. We may be persecuted, but we are not forsaken. We may be struck down, but we will never be destroyed. Here is the purpose of all these testings and trials, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our bodies. Let's say that together. Always carrying about in our body the death of Jesus or the dying of Jesus so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested or revealed through our body, through our earthen vessel. 
For we who live are constantly being delivered unto death. I had you underline that verse on Sunday morning. Present tense, constantly being delivered unto death. The circumstances that you and I kick at every week are actually often ordained by God to bring you to the place of death. Death to self. Death to your own life. Death to self-reliance. Self-sufficiency. Strip you of all those things. We are constantly being delivered unto death. In the domes of Bible school, we are being delivered unto death. In, in, our, in my Bible school days, that was death being worked to me. Today, death is being worked to me. In your life, death is being worked to you. In your job, death is being worked to you. Who you work for, death is being worked to you. And this is... So we, are, we who live are constantly being delivered unto death for Jesus' sake. So that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So death works in us. So that life may work in others. Okay? Now, let's turn to Isaiah chapter 57, <clears throat> verse 15. <clears throat> in verse 15, For thus says the High and Holy One who lives forever, whose name is Holy, I dwell on a high and holy place, and also with the broken, the contrite and lowly of heart, spirit, in order to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive the heart of the broken. The word contract means broken. In Psalm 51, verse 17, David said, O Lord, thou wilt not despise a broken spirit. In verse 17, David said, uh, he is actually broken about his sin with Bathsheba. Psalm 51 is, is, is the psalm of penitence when Nathan confronts him. And he starts in verse 1, But be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your mercy, blot out my sins. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. And then he says in verse 17, For the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. And he says, A broken and contrite heart, O God, thou will not set aside, thou will not despise. In other words, you love a broken, broken person. And I want to say something to you today. God is not interested in what caused you to be broken. He just wants you to be broken. <coughs> You might say, sin broke me. Well, that wasn't good. But God is just happy that you can have me broken before Him. Circumstances have broken me. But God says, I'm happy that you finally got broken before me. What an awesome thing. Okay, we may be seated. Father, we pray your blessing upon this word. Point the message to our hearts and help us to really understand it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So we're speaking on <clears throat> two passages from Sunday morning. One was 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and the second was John 6, when Jesus breaks the bread and gives it to the disciples, and they're available to minister. Sunday morning we spoke about a servant of God is somebody who's available to minister, remember? And we, we talked about the beautiful thing about the servant sees the miracles. Okay? The servant sees the miracles. Today we want to speak about a servant of God, really, a true servant of God, is somebody who is genuinely, genuinely broken. Now, I want you to think about these two words, okay? And today I'll be speaking about the blessings of brokenness and God's process of breaking our lives. And it's kind of really interesting to see this. Um, think about these two words. Broken. The second word is blessed. The two words don't seem to go together, do they? 
you don't normally think of being broken as something as something being blessed. But I want you to think about these two words. Let's say the two words together. Broken, broken, and blessed. Broken, and blessed. Think about, when you think about these words, we'll say them again. Think of Jesus. Broken, and then blessed. Think about Joseph. Broken, 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 and then the last. Think about Moses, broken, 40 years in the desert, and then there was a blessing. Paul, broken. I want you to think about that. All of us know what it means to be broken. Have you ever had situations, and I know you have, don't put your hand up, <laughs> where the situations were so painful, the circumstances in your life were so painful that you didn't want to wake up the next day? Has it ever happened to you? You don't want to raise your head from the pillow. Tears wouldn't stop because the circumstances in your life were so crushing. You were broken. You were even shattered. And those circumstances, just you just couldn't believe that God could even use those circumstances in your life to bring a blessing. I remember early days of ministry. Circumstances. People that you ministered to that would hurt you. Circumstances that would be hard and painful. And when you go through those situations, sometimes you say, God, I want out. Just want to get out of the situation. This is not fair, Lord. And I want you to understand something very important. Nobody feels blessed when they're being broken. In fact, some of the hardest, most painful times that you will ever go through, however, are the times when God is preparing you for the greatest blessing. And one thing I did discover, and I hope to remember all my life, is that after we're broken, God brings a blessing far more than we can understand in fact I would dare say that you're going to be more, more fruitful only after you've been broken I would dare say that I think that God's whole goal for his servants is that he would break them and I would dare say that uh, a servant of God cannot be used by God you will not go far with God until He has uniquely and wonderfully broken you. And I don't want you to be scared about this because this is God's loving process for every Christian's life. I want you to understand it so that when these things happen in your life, you don't walk away from God. You don't think God is unfair. He's, he's, he's not on the throne for you. But actually you would begin to begin to realize that maybe God's best hours, best days are a little bit down the road. Joseph had to be broken by his brothers before he was blessed as prime minister. Moses in the desert murdered a man, very broken about it, 40 years. Jacob the manipulator walked in the desert just constantly, constantly manipulated. And one day God got a hold of him. The river Jabbok of Burk wrestled with him, broke his thigh, and there was a physical breaking there. And Jacob limped, and then he was the 
friends with God. Have you ever thought about that? God does these things in our lives. And sometimes the situations are so bad, you just, you just Lord, what is going on in my life? I, I heard a story, and a true story. This is a little funny story, but just a little story of a mom one day who was so overwhelmed. She had her dad pass away uh, in the same week. She had a major hospital uh, problem in her own life. And the baby, it was the bills were well stacked up. The, you know, all kinds of things were going on in her life, and the baby was having a, a terrible time crying. And so the mom one day just broke down, and she began crying and crying and crying. And the little three-year-old baby saw the mom and didn't know what to do, and so she literally did this: she took the pacifier from her mouth and put it in her <laughs> Sometimes you wish somebody would do that. <laughs> or you expect God to do that. But I want to just say something. It's very important to know what is God after in breaking me. And if you can remember five most important words. God in his breaking process is after my death to self. What God is trying to break me from is self-sufficiency. What God is trying to get me to do is be totally dependent on Him. You see, what happens is we, we kind of get saved, we're, we, and then we start living our lives, and we've got our natural gifts, and we've got our natural talents, and we've got our social security, and we've got our social status, and we've got, and we've got all these different things we've achieved and we can do in our natural strength. And many times we don't even think we need God in it. We, just so, so we can just go on automatic and we actually are living in the natural. We're not dependent on God. And so we just kind of like live until a situation comes and then we really reveal what is inside of us. But what God is really after in breaking us is breaking that life of self-will. He wants to break our self-will. He does not want to crush our spirit. He wants to break our self-will. He wants to break our reliance on ourselves, on our, our self-dependency on, on ourselves. And so God begins a process in our lives. And that process uh, is just what He's trying to do is bring death into our lives. Spiritual, the, the way we talk about death to ourselves. Now, I want you to understand this. Okay, listen, listen carefully. I, I love this passage. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And follow this with me. <clears throat> Oh, I was just really thinking about this, this topic a lot. In verse 8, <coughs> Paul is telling us the, the process of being broken. And he says here, For we are afflicted in every way, not crushed, perplexed, but not despairing, persecuted, not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying about in the body the dying of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in us. So death works in us, so life may work in others. What is Paul even thinking about? Where does he get this illustration from? Where does the Holy Spirit get this illustration from? He's thinking back, I believe, on the day when Jesus, before his crucifixion, told his disciples something very important. Listen carefully. And you'll understand the purpose of God breaking us. Jesus said in John chapter 12, verse 24 and 25, he said, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone as a grain of wheat. But if it dies, then it brings forth much fruit. Now I want you to just picture this for a moment. Just picture this, this, this illustration of Jesus, okay? Imagine if I have a grain of wheat. I could hold this grain of wheat in my hand for years. <coughs> Nothing will happen. I can put it on top of a barn. I can put it in a in a in a in, a, in some grain uh, container. I can put it anywhere else, and nothing will happen to it. Subsequently, if it doesn't have the right atmosphere, it will rot. It will be destroyed. That's what the grain of wheat does. It abides alone. But if I take the grain of wheat and I throw it into the earth, I put it on the earth, and I allow that earth to cover it up. Now, what I've done is I'm allowing that grain of wheat to be in a position where it will die. 
because very soon, when it goes into the, into the ground, God has designed for that chemicals of the ground, the earth, the heat of the sun, the moisture in the, in the, in the, in the ground to start to do a process on the grain of wheat, just like the circumstances of your life. And what will happen is those chemicals in the soil will start to now go against the grain of wheat and it will start to tear the outer shell of the grain of wheat. And that hard outer shell starts to get torn. And when that breaking process happens, a little shoot comes out and slowly pushes its way up through the ground. A root goes down. Soon a beautiful plant comes up, a stalk of weed. And then over a period of time, a head of wheat or a head of corn or whatever it is. And think of the process. Every one of those heads of wheat has the potential. Every one of them, every seed has the potential if I plant them over and over and over again to plant millions of acres of wheat. Did you hear what I said? In other words, if I just took the grain of wheat that made the plant and I took one grain of wheat, I took all those grains of wheat and I redid the same process and I buried them in the ground and I planted them and I allowed the process of death to happen in them, you know what's going to happen? Another shoot of wheat, another shoot of wheat, another shoot of wheat. I take the grain, I put it back in the ground, another shoot of wheat, another shoot of wheat, another shoot of wheat, until millions of acres of wheat are formed. Jesus was saying that's what our life should be like. In other words, if it just remains alone, if I just keep my life without death, then I don't give it over to God, I don't surrender it over to God. What's going to happen is my life remains alone. It remains without a purpose. It just is a self-lived life, live for myself. It hasn't died, it hasn't served God's purpose. Because until I break my self-will and break my self-reliance, God cannot use me. Death must precede life. And Jesus said this, Jesus said, listen, unyielded seed is unbroken and cannot produce anything. And Christ was the perfect example of this. Listen to me carefully. Jesus, if Jesus had lived on this earth and had not died, then Jesus would have done a wonderful some miracles and many people would have been helped. And then he would have gone over here and taught some people over here. And he would have preached some messages over here. And those messages would be wonderful and recorded. But guess what? It would end there. But Jesus himself went according to the Father's will and allowed himself to die on the cross, be buried, and rise again. And because of his resurrection today, millions and millions and millions of people through the centuries have believed in Christ. And today they have the resurrection life of Jesus inside of them. Do you understand what I'm talking about? And now Jesus is simply saying to us, listen guys, I saved you. Now, I want you to do the same thing. I want you to allow yourself to be crucified, to allow death to work in you so that my life can work in others. What a process. Give your life away. Allow, allow me to break you so that my life can work in others. For that, And so in this illustration that Paul is using, there are two illustrations. And the first one is death and the seed. But the second one he's using is very interesting. He's using the idea of a light, a servant of God with a light inside of him in an earthen vessel. And I want you to see this because they're both very beautiful illustrations. He says, listen, for God, in verse 5, for we are servants for Christ's sake, right? And he says, for God, who has made light to shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to reveal the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And then he goes on to say, for we have this earthen vessel that the excellency of the power, the majesty of the power, will not be of us believers, but of Jesus as I thought of this illustration, I thought of something I, I've shared with you before, an illustration, but I want to do it again. In a certain village in ancient days in Turkey, there's a story told of a particular kind of lanterns that were made in these villages. 
And these, these lanterns were made of earthen vessels, earthenware, so the clay was put. And this is how they made the lantern. Very unique, very highly priced lanterns. The potter would take the vessel of clay, and he would put it on the potter's wheel, and he would fashion the lantern the way he wanted it. And then after it was done, he would put the colors, red, gold, whatever colors he wanted, make it very beautiful. And then he would put it in the fire kiln to be purified, or for the colors to really be inside and everything to be just right hardened. But once this big lantern was made, the earthen band was all colored and beautiful, he wasn't finished yet. Strangely enough, in this particular village, they did something else. They put this lantern or this earthen vessel into a machine that then would brick the lantern in 15 to 35 different parts. It was different cracks, different ways. They would just put the lantern in such a way and, and press it little by little by little so cracks came on every side of the lantern. You say, what a funny, what a, what a funny thing to do. So the lantern would have cracks all over it. And then what they would do is they would take this beautiful gold resin gum and where the cracks were, they would loosen it slightly and they would put this gold beautiful resin gum like a filigree work where the cracks were. Now listen what used to happen. When the lantern finally was all stuck together, they would put a light inside of it. And suddenly, when they put that lantern on top of a lampstand, it was the most amazing sight ever. Because through the broken cracks, through the gold resin, this amazing light would come and shine through like gold. And every lantern was different. It was like this brokenness would bring, shine forth the light through the vessel. It was very unique. And a more and a simple earthenware vessel, lantern now, would go for a very, very high price. My point, however, is this. The vessel wasn't completed until it was broken. And what God wants us in our lives is the same process. You see, what happens often t for us is we, we serve the Lord. It's not enough that we have knowledge. It's that God wants us to be broken. So that what comes out of us is not us, but Jesus. Now I want you to think about this. And I, I just put down a few things that I really thought about. <coughs> Think about this. <clears throat> Four things that I think would characterize brokenness. We had a wonderful time as a start thinking about some of these things and talking about some of these things. Uh, when, you, when you really talk about somebody being broken, wh what would you say is the characteristics of brokenness? We know the characteristics of love. Well, what does it mean that somebody really is broken? A, a servant of God, a person, a Christian is broken. Let's listen to some of that. Number one, a servant who's broken is stripped of their dependency on self or talent. Uh, can I say something to you tonight? Your talents and gifts, as wonderful as God gave them, are to be amplified with brokenness and dependence on God. If you use your talents and gifts, even teaching or preaching, without dependency on God, uh, there is no brokenness. I remember Pastor Stevens once saying, he said, he said, it's easy for people that are gifted to operate in the natural and are not allow God to break them. And what comes out is academic, but not life. Do you understand what I'm talking about? Now, think with me, and it's, that's a process that everybody's going through. 
But here's, here's what we look at. Stripped of the dependency on self, talent, wealth. In other words, I use wealth, or I use the fact that I have a good social status, so I, I'm okay, or my job is okay, and my career is okay, and I, I really am okay. So I really don't need to depend on God. My image appearance, my fashion, I'm not talking here to anyone in particular. I'm just, just talking in general. I'm just talking in general. I may be looking at you, but I'm not talking to you. <laughs> Please, don't get subjective. All right. My fashion. My fashion. <laughs> my appearance. My image. Do you understand that? My wealth. <laughs> Think about it. Why to be in control of my life and so so important and what I what I think about a person who's broken it doesn't matter if they're wealthy it doesn't matter if they you know if they're talented or gifted they just don't operate in their gifts and talents in the natural but they just really are dependent on God they say God here I am I just need your filling of the Holy Spirit I just need you today I really recognize I'm nothing without you. Please fill me. Please bless me. Please, please let me work, work, walk close to the cross. Please help me to understand that I died, and and I I live. Christ lives in me, and please use me, Lord. And you know God does that. Brokenness does not happen overnight. But it's a process that carries on through our whole lives. We'll be, God will be breaking us till we're 75 and 80 years old. And He will do that. He touches our lives and He just wants a broken servant. And it's such a beautiful thing because He gets all the glory for it. And I just want to talk about this. This is so important. Please understand. The day is coming where something's going to offend you and you're going to get hurt. And you're going to you just understand something. God is going to use circumstances and people in your life and you're going to get hurt. And if you're not broken about it, you're not broken, you don't understand what I'm talking about tonight. The very circumstances that God is using in your life could actually be to bring you to the cross, die to yourself, could actually take you out of the race because you don't realize what God is trying to do in your life. So please understand it. I think, I think Bible school is awesome, but I think beyond Bible school, beyond Bible school is brokenness. You understand what I'm talking about tonight? Beyond beyond knowledge, beyond Bible school, beyond years, how many years I've been in the ministry, and none of those things matter. It's just that God is after me. God is after me. And he's trying to work in my life. And He wants me to be broken. That's so beautiful. Think about that. Number two. Uh, <clears throat> I love this. They love God and reverence His Word. Uh, Isaiah 66, 1 and 2. This is what it says. This is what it said. It says, uh, uh, Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. To whom will I look but to the one who what? Trembles at my word. And a person is broken towards God, is broken in spirit, and just, just really has this reverence to God. You know, I, I, love, I love it when people have walked for 30 years and they still have the same hunger for the word of God as if like they are brand new Christians. It's just amazing when that happens. They're just so excited about the Lord. It's such a great sign of brokenness, like because God's word is coming out, and I, I really want the fresh manna from heaven. And it's such a beautiful thing. That's awesome. And number three, I, I, I love this. They love people. A broken person is sensitive to people. Remember this very important thing. They're sensitive to people. Here's the second one. They love people and are tender, not harsh, in dealing, dealing with all people. Uh, not, uh, not just believers, but even the unsaved. Yeah. When you treat the unsaved, you should be treating them as potential brothers of Jesus. Because how would they come to know the Lord? You look at them and you say, I want to see that person in church one day. So I'm going to treat them just like I would treat the brother of Christ. You love them. And you treat them with gentleness. David, David said, Oh God, be gracious to me uh, and, and forgive me my sins because of my loving kindness. 
And then he said, Lord, a broken heart thou will not despise. And then he said, Lord, and when I'm converted, then I will teach transgressors thy ways. And what we do basically is God has been so gracious to us, so merciful to us, that we begin to then pour out this grace and mercy and love and gentleness towards other people. Amen? Mm -hmm. In other words, we never, a broken person just recognizes how much God has done for them. How gracious God has been for them. How, how much God has done. How, how many times the secret sins God forgave. And then we just begin to realize, oh my Lord, I want to be gentle. I want to be tender with people. A broken person is gentle and tender. I love that. Sensitive to the Holy Spirit with people's lives. Because we just recognize how much God has done for us. <clears throat> And I could just preach a whole message about every one of these things. It's so beautiful. Think about it. Put this in your Bible. And think about it the whole month. And say, God, do I have these characteristics? You Maybe you can add a few more the Holy Spirit gives you. But just, just Lord, do I have these characteristics in my life? Do, am I really a broken person? Broken towards God. And this is beautiful. They are truly thankful for all their circumstances and tools that God used to mold them. And I was thinking of this life of Joseph. Remember Joseph? I mean, really, Joseph could have been so bitter. He could have been so, so, you know, like all the situations that happened. The story here is when his brothers come at the end. And they said, Joseph, now daddy's died. We're afraid of you. And Joseph spoke kindly to them. He says, no, no, I'm in God's place. I'm in God's place. Uh, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. It is such a beautiful story. And Joseph was so broken about God's goodness in his life. And a broken person can actually, is somebody very thankful. You know what I love? I love, I love this. And I know you love this. Have you ever been around people that just when you talk to them and you, you recognize there's nothing of self, they're just totally stripped of this. It's not about them. It's not about their work. It's not about their ministry. It's not about it's not about their lives. It's just like God, God, God is everything. And they recognize that without God, they're nothing. It's such an awesome thing when that happens. Uh, they love people and they're sensitive and gentle to people with people. It's such a beautiful thing. It's a sign of great maturity when you do that. Uh, the third thing, they love the Word of God, and you can walk away from this. Says, I've just tasted heaven together with fellowship with this believer. There was there was no, no self. It was a process. They didn't just reach that. God did something very wonderful in their lives. Amen? And you can see the brokenness and gratefulness of God. Amen. Think about this. And so in our lives, the same way. Just think about it. Just think about the process, okay? I'm going to give you an illustration. Ready? And when we hear the illustration, you can identify. Here's a man we're going to illustrate this truth with. Peter. Peter. Boy, we're all happy it's Peter. <laughs> but think about this. Peter. Peter was an apostle. Um, uh, this, this was a moment in Peter's life that he was really just very broken about. Uh, think about it. He's one of the inner circle. He's considered... Actually, there's more spoken about Peter and Paul than any other of the other apostles. So Peter is one of the inside three of Jesus. He's, he's considered among the leaders of the church. And Jesus now is going to work in his life. And so we should, be cons we should not be concerned that Christ is working in our lives always. Okay? And this is what Jesus does. Peter is a fisherman. When I think about Peter, I think about somebody who is impulsive. These were his areas. Impulsive, uh, uh, temperamental, up and down, full of emotions, you know, very, very uh, confident in himself, and then very fearful of the other end when things didn't go right. Depart from me, God. I'm a, I'm a sinful man. And Lord, help me, save me. Lord, can I come in the water? You know, this is Peter a little bit. Just think, uh, this is something important I want to say. Uh, Peter, Rash, different things with Peter's life, and you say, you say, God, why did you choose Peter? And God will say to you, because the same reason why I chose you, because I see something in you, as a young believer or a mature believer, I see you as somebody who I can use greatly for me. 
think about Peter. Jesus calls Peter. The first thing he does to Peter is he changes his name. He doesn't even start working with Peter. The first thing he meets Peter, Peter, your name will no longer be Simon the Reed, the shaky stone, but you will be Petros. You will be Petros the rock. And then here comes Peter. Now listen, listen to how the Lord works with Peter's life. Wow. Peter, when God works with us, this is important to understand, when God is trying to break us, He will always break us in areas not that we're often weak in, but in areas that we think we're strong in, where the self reigns. Alright? Can you understand that? For example, if your area that God says you are reliant on is, you know, God says you're really relying on yourself a lot, um, God says, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take away your self-reliance. Anything that comes from your dependence on me, I'm going to take away. Okay, now here's Peter. Peter's problems were these. And Jesus starts. Matthew 40 is a storm. Peter gets in the water. And he sees Jesus in the boat. And here's Peter. And listen to how God is working with Peter's life, okay? Uh, Lord, can I come? Yes, Peter, come. And then Peter's walking on the water. And we know the story. He begins to sink. And Jesus says, picks up his hand, pulls him out. And says, oh, you of little faith. Think about it. Peter had a, a very a very strong self-sufficiency, a very strong reliance on himself. By the way, most of these things happened in the front of the other disciples. Number two, Peter had a strong will. It was Peter's way. Lord, in Matthew 16, you are not going to the cross. No way. I am in place of your father on the earth. <laughs> you know what I mean? You are not going to the cross. No way. But Jesus said, I can't think behind me. Peter, you savor the things of man and not of God. And Jesus was hitting Peter's self-will. Do you understand what I'm talking about? And so God, sometimes I want you to understand this, God... God targets areas that we are strong in, that we don't think we need Him. Or we're naturally strong in those areas. Um, Matthew 18. Our oh, Lord, he does not walk with Jesus. Two and a half years of Bible school is over. So now he's just very excited. Lord, Lord, listen, Lord, uh, you know, how many times should I forgive my brother? Lord, should I do it seven times? <laughs> Pharisees say it three times. I want to show you how much I understand of your grace and your mercy and your teachings of the all of mercy and grace. So here, Lord, you seven times. And I think of Jesus saying to the disciples, and I don't think Jesus may, I just think the disciples are all there, and Jesus says, No, Peter, 70 times seven. I want you to understand that. I want you to become like God is. I want you to understand that mercy never stops. I want you to understand that forgiveness has no limit. Can you understand it for people, Peter? And God was dealing there with Peter's self-righteousness. And then there was the story of Peter. Listen to Peter. Just God and Peter. Uh, Peter, uh, Peter says the washing of the feet. Lord, you will never wash my feet. Was that humility? It was pride. Lord, you will never wash my feet. And Jesus says, Peter, in front of the disciples, if I don't wash your feet, you will have no part in it. Throughout his life, Peter was being allowed by God. And God was speaking to areas of his life that he was changing. Are you following what I'm saying? Bible school was on. Training was on. 
training was on, and training was on. And there was just Peter, and Peter is being trained. There was the classes on the Mount Olivet Discourse, and the Sermon on the Mount, and the Light of the World, and Jesus was teaching Peter. But Peter was growing, growing, growing. And then the day came when Peter still needed the ma major breaking, and that was the big one. That was the big one, because Peter, <clears throat> up to this time, had had breakings in his life, but not the big one. This one was when Jesus said, Peter, I tell you what, all of you will deny me. And Peter said, no, Lord. Even if all deny you and walk away, I will not deny you. And then it happened. And Peter went into the courtyard of the high priest, and we, we know the story. Peter, but with the servant girl, I think you're one of them. And Peter says, I don't even know the man. I don't even know the man. And then the next story said so beautifully, Peter went out and he wept bitterly. Uh, the word in the Greek is very powerful, actually, to study it. It just means Peter was sobbing. He was sobbing. Four years of Bible school. I'm training. Uh, I finished my classes. And now, what is going on with me? And, and actually, Peter did not know that this was actually the greatest thing that could ever happen in his life. He's sobbing uncontrollably. Uh, this happened in front of everybody. I, I don't believe this happened to me. And Peter is at this point of his life, which is the lowest point of his life, but actually, it is actually the greatest point of his life. Many times when God is breaking us, he sees something there that we don't see. And he arranges to target those areas. If your wealth will keep you from following God, then God will target your wealth. He doesn't want to hurt you. He just doesn't want that to be a defense. If you think that, you know, I, I, this is what I am, and I, my, my, my status and my identity is in who I am, and this my reputation or what I've done and God says hold on a second there's, there's so much of self there I'm going to just show you a little I'm going to allow certain situations to happen and they will happen over time and listen I'm not trying to hurt you I just want you to realize that it's all about me please will you understand it can I just work deep inside of you and then you come to the point where you say God I'm broken I'm crushed I'm shattered and God picks you up and God builds you up and God restores you and he puts the gum on you and the glue on you and you say, God, but, I, but I'm shattered and I'm broken and it doesn't look good. I feel better if I wasn't broken in the first place. And God says, no, no. Actually, it's good that you were broken because I love, love the fact that you were broken this way because if you weren't, then you would think it's all about yourself. This is when the gold comes out. This is when the glory comes out. This is exactly where I want you to be. Isn't that great? And sometimes, I just want to say this, friends, sometimes we, we, don't, we don't understand how God does it, but God arranges the circumstances of our lives. God arranges the, the people that are going to use, He's going to use to break us. You know what we would like? You know what we would like? We would like God to do this on the private. We wouldn't like God to do this in front of people. We wouldn't like that to happen. We'd like God to, you know what we'd like? God, can you just give me a book on brokenness? <laughs> And can you just tell me the two pages I should read about my situation? And I will read it, Lord, I promise you. I'll just read it and I'll be broken. <laughs> but you know what God does? He doesn't do that. He often uses tools that we don't like. And that's what really bugs us. <laughs> Lord, I can take it from my wife. I can take it from somebody. But don't use that person. <laughs> and the person that you think is your biggest enemy the person who's irritant the person that actually you just say God why is that person why 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 that person is there to make sure that you will come to brokenness is that something and I hated it always and I know you hate it also. So, wow, praise the Lord. What are we looking at? We say, God, just bring me to the place where I can be stripped of myself. 
where I can be broken to the word, where I can let your glory shine out of me. Oh God, please do that. And I promise you, I promise you, your enemy or your situations or your circumstances are not the problem. And when God has got a hold of your heart, He will do something powerful. Sometimes your enemy just is taken out of the picture. The, the, the situation, that, and you realize, you begin to realize that that situation was not my enemy. That situation was to bring me, to change me, to mold me, to make me like Jesus. Oh, I didn't understand it, but now this is what it's, what it's all about, God. And God, I just say, oh, Lord, help me. And you know what? It happens. And I'll just say a few last closing things tonight. God's process says, I'm breaking you, but I'm not going to destroy you. I'll afflict you, but I won't. I won't forsake you. I'll persecute you, but you won't be forsaken and cast down. I break you, but you will not be destroyed. In other words, God, God puts pressure. Listen, listen, friends. When God puts pressure in your life, and God's allowing situations in your life, it's so beautiful to just go to God and say, God, thank you, thank you. I don't understand it. I, I don't understand what's going on, but I just know you have a bigger purpose in my life. And, and this is what God does. It's like the machine. I love that, that, that thing. The machine is, you know, it's like you already, you say, God, I'm already a Christian for a long time. I'm going to church. I'm going to Sunday morning. I'm going to Wednesday night. I go to Bible school. I'm growing. Why are you lying in situations? What more do you want me to do? Uh, you know, I thought the academics was all important. And God says, no, there's something far greater. I want the gold to come out of you. It's something deeper. You don't understand what I'm talking about. But in the days to come, hereafter, you will understand. And, and God's, you know, God just puts the machine. And you say, but I'm all painted. And I'm all, I put in the fire. And I got my... And God says, no, I'm putting the machine. And I'm allowing the cracks to come in. And it's okay. And I'm allowing the cracks to come in. And can I just tell you something important? When does God stop? When in that area, you surrender to Him. Are you listening? When in that area, you will surrender to Him. And I'll tell you, guarantee you one thing, my friend. You know the area God's after. I won't tell you. The Holy Spirit has told you a hundred times that that's the area He's after. And when you surrender that area, you allow God to change you in that area. The pressure's removed. There's something else I'll tell you. The pressure will never be to destroy you. God's joy is to use you again. He will never put so much pressure that and even if you're resisting, even if you're resisting and resisting and resisting, God will not crush you. He will not devastate you. Do you know what God will do? You say, but what if a person never yields to Him? tell you what God will do. God will put them at the side, put them on the shelf, and say, here you go. You might alone. You'll be in the body for years and years and years and years. But I can't use you. Because you're so filled with yourself. Somebody could say, Pastor, there were days when God used me a lot, but I don't know why for the last 10 years God has not been using me anything. And I would say to you, have you ever thought about the times when God was trying to tell you something? When God was trying to break you? When God was trying to do something in your life, friend? What do you do with it? And if your answer to me is, well, I'm just a strong person. I just, I just know I can hang in there. I, I can do this. I say, do you, do you change? Do you allow God to change you? Are you allowing God to change? No, I'm just a strong person. I can hang in there. I, I can do it on my own way. I've got a lot of strength and will, and I just hang in there. He says, God ever spoken to you about changing something in your life? He says, No, I, I'm good. I, I, you know, I'm just like, well, okay, amen. Here it goes. God, it goes again and again and again. And if you say no, 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 it just leaves you for a little while here. 
and they say, God, why aren't you using me? He will use you. First comes that. Oh, I hope you get it tonight. It's awesome. It's not what we do. It's how we do. It's not what we do for the Lord. It's who we represent. It's not what we do. It's what's death we work to me. It's a beautiful thing to be allow God to be broken. And, and, and the pain is worth it. The process is worth it. God uses the target areas. God uses the circumstances. God knows the pressure. And when it's over, then I am perfected. And God begins to use me more and more. And life goes to others. And what an awesome thing that happens when that happens. God's process of a broken servant. Could you think about that tonight? Could you just think about that tonight? God, you just don't want a servant. You want the broken servant. And you say, God, I, I, I just want to go there. We're not reached yet. But God, I want to be there. I just want where death is being worked in my life so life could be worked in others. I want when I get up to speak in the days to come that it's not about just what I, what I stored in my heart, but I want life to be manifested through me. Uh, you see, it, it's, not, it's not the word only. It's the life of Jesus. And if you have a life with Christ that's dead to self, then what happens is the anointing flows. And, and I'm, I, everybody does a great job. Every one of us does a great job when we do that, of just preaching and just preaching because that's such a great thing. I think when life is life is manifested in me, it's an awesome thing. You see, it's not just I'm giving you something uh, in a Bible study that I've read. I'm giving you Jesus. I'm just giving you Jesus. It's, it's just awesome when that happens. And God is just, oh, praise the Lord. It's so good. It's so good. So God, I don't want anything to be an obstacle to that. I just want you to break me. Amen. And if we're broken and we're available to minister, God can use us and do great miracles to us. And the servants will see those miracles. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Just worship the Lord for a few minutes in your heart. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God, we just don't want to pass by this message. Think about it for a few minutes and go by and forget about it for the next week. Just go to the next word and the next message. But we really believe that this is the message of the hour. Maybe the message of the year. Maybe, Lord, it's, it's, it's not preaching and ministry and all those other things, God, but it's a very deep, wonderful thought about what you're really after. Your word says that we're constantly delivered unto death so the life of Jesus may be manifested in us. What's bad about that? What's bad about that? What's bad about being delivered from self? What's bad about being delivered from self-reliance? What's bad about being, being uh, dependent on Christ completely? What's bad about not being concerned about my reputation because we don't have any? What, what is the reputation we have? What is it that we're saved by grace? Who are we? We're not defined as, uh, you know, uh, we, as businessmen. We're not defined as uh, missionaries or pastors. Or we're not defined, Lord, as, as what we do in our workplaces. God, we are who we are by the grace of God. And when we talk about, we talk about anything, Lord, we talk about Jesus. We talk about what He's done in our lives and we say, God, thank you, thank you, thank you that you use us and help us to do it. And then bless us, God. And when we, we just allow that that to work in us, God, there's such a power in our lives. We don't have to be pastors to have that. We're just anointed. We walk with an anointing. 
people look at abolish and say, what is with that person? They're so different. They, they, their life is not about this earth, about the values, about the world, about, about what they have. Their life is just like Christ's life. It's, it's, it's centered around Him. It's spirit-led. It's led by Christ. And, and God, we, just, we have this amazing gratitude for little things that happen in our lives. And we're the happiest people of all because our life is in heaven. Thank you, Lord. It helps us to have that in our lives. Amen. Amen. Okay.
Well, what a wonderful blessing it was to hear that message by Pastor Carl. It's uh, been about a, a week uh, since his passing, and it's uh, obviously to each one of us it, it appears to be uh, surreal. But we do know this, we have this promise that the circle will not be broken, that uh, our beloved uh, pastor and friend uh, just went ahead of us, that he is uh, uh, dancing, dancing and rejoicing and praising the Lord. And uh, we're very, very happy for him. And uh, soon and very soon, uh, we all will be together. So let's just bow and pray and uh, uh, close this uh, with the benediction. Father, we do ask, Lord, for your blessings, the richness of your fullness to be upon Sue, be upon Andrew, Andrew, be upon the entire family, and be upon the church family. Lord, Pastor Carl was a spiritual father to many, Lord, to many individuals. Lord, he revealed the reality of who you are to so many lives. Just over and over, we hear testimonies popping up on how his life was used to touch so many people. We thank you, Lord, for his life. We know, okay, that uh, he's a life that was sold out for you a life that was spent that was spent for you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, that you were so gracious to put us uh, and to connect us with precious Pastor Carl. And we ask you, Lord, that you would uh, bless each individual that's listening. Lord, we, uh, we pray, Lord, that you will keep us uh, healthy. We pray, Lord, that uh, that each, uh, congr each member of the congregation would be spiritually enriched, Lord, that, uh, that we would draw near to you like never before, and that we would have uh, hunger in our heart for the word like never before, a really uh, hunger for fellowship, Lord, as soon as this lockdown breaks, Lord, that we would not... Uh, we would not be in an isolation mode, but we would hunger for your fellowship. We pray, Lord, that you would cause the churches not to decrease, but the churches all over, okay, a greater grace. And all over India, the born-again churches, to really increase, Lord. And uh, the people would be searching, and the people would be finding you. We ask for a blessing upon all those, uh, Lord, that, uh, that are day laborers and uh, are maybe having financial hardships. We ask you, Lord, that you will really, you will be their provider, that you will open up and, and use people, Lord, to help. But Lord, ultimately, you are the one that provides for every living creature, Lord, that you would, uh, you would provide for them, Lord, and thank you, Lord, for each family that's tuned in. We do lift up hard-hit areas, Lord, red zones. We pray, Lord, that you would cause this virus, this virus just to fizzle out, Lord, that it would have no more power, no more strength, Lord. Greater is you that's within us than, than the viruses in the world, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you would put a shelter and a protection on over each household. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.